Numbers chapter 13. So our series is called Counting the Cost. What price are you willing to pay for a victorious Christian life? And uh, we know that we see, at least in the end of the book of Genesis, we had the beginning of us, of God's chosen people, and then in the book of Exodus, we have God's chosen people being um, freed to serve God, and then given the law or given instructions on how to serve God. Um, Leviticus continues that, and there's some narrative events in there that are that pl- that go right in line with the end of Exodus and the beginning of Numbers. We skipped here to Numbers because that's how God led me, but we're seeing that God is bringing now. Uh, his intent is to bring the children of Israel into the place of blessing. His intent is to bring them uh, into a place that he has promised them, into a place where they will mature, into a place where they're going to fight some battles, right? And and we've talked about the fact that the, the analogy here is not, I believe, the metaphor is not heaven, but it is the victorious Christian life. Um, and so that's how we're applying it. And, And, you know, there is a price that has to be paid in order to enjoy that victorious life. There was a price that Israel had to pay. It wasn't an automatic thing. There was there was some steps they had to go through and there were going to be some battles that they were going to have to go through to enjoy the blessing that God had guaranteed them that the blessing was going to happen. They just had to be willing to pay the price. And so we're going to continue in that narrative this morning. And right here in Numbers chapter 13. So let's uh, read silently along with me as I read our passage this morning. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men were heads of children of Israel. And so then it proceeds the list, uh, each man that he, choo- that he chooses, one man from each tribe. I just want to note a couple of men in particular, verse 6, of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. We all are familiar with Cain, uh, Caleb. Uh, did you, you, know, you know what his name means? Um, people name their children Caleb. Uh, a lot. The, the name means uh, the tenacity or fury of a dog. <laughs> Arr, you know, that kind of thing. That's the kind of guy Caleb was. He had the tenacity or fury of an angry canine. All right. So that's Caleb for you. All right. And then the other one I want to point out uh, in particular is verse eight. It says of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshea, the son of Nun. It tells us in verse 16, these are the names of the men which Moses sent out uh, sent to spy out the land. Twelve spies. Ever, anybody ever heard the song, Twelve Went Down to Spy on Canaan? Ten were bad and two were good. All right, we won't sing it. Um, now, no, uh, interesting thing also to note, it says, And Moses called Oshea, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. Okay? By the way, that's Joshua. We're, we're familiar with him. He's called Oshea here, but he, he names him. He sort of renames him, which is something that Jesus often did with his disciples. Uh, he names him Jehoshua or Joshua, which is the Hebrew form of the name which is translated from Greek into English in our New Testament, Jesus. Joshua is a type of, of, of Christ in the Old Testament. So this is the first time, not the first time, Joshua actually has come up once before, but this is the first time we hear of Caleb and Joshua together. So these men are chosen and they're sent into the land. Now, why were they sent into the land? God told us, uh, as he commanded Moses, why he wanted Moses to do this. But it, it elaborates here in verse 17 and forward. It says, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Go ye up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And, excuse me, and be ye of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. 
That's, that's notable here in just a few verses. It says, So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zan and Arib as men come to Hamath. And they ascended uh, by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Telmai, the son of Anak, were. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. Now, I don't know about you, but it typically does not take two men to carry one cluster of grapes. I, we had some, uh, some table grapes, as they're sometimes called at our house uh, recently, uh, after a recent grocery trip. Uh, the grapes did not stay in our house for very long after that grocery trip, but we had it here, and it's in a little plastic baggie, and uh, you know, one of my, my two-year-old can pick up the whole cluster and run off with them if, she, if we would uh, allow her to do so. So these grapes are not your typical table grapes. This land and the uh, prosperity of its soil is not the typical farmland. This, this one cluster of grapes was so large and so bountiful and so extreme that these two men had to bear it between them upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook Eskol because of the cluster of grapes. Eskol is a cluster of grapes, uh, which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching the land after 40 years days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran. Now that's where they went after the whole incident with Aaron and, and Miriam. If you remember, they came into the wilderness of Paran. This is the last stage of the trip. This is the last moment before they begin their campaign to enter into the promised land. They're at the cusp. They're at the precipice, right? We, we could say it. Well, uh, hold on. I'm getting my cart ahead of my horse again. So they, came, so, so they come back to the Paran where the, where the children of Israel are cam encamped to Kadesh. And they brought uh, back word unto them, unto all the congregation, and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us. And surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Sounds like a wonderful report so far, isn't it? Doesn't it? Hold on. There's a but coming. Yeah? Verse 28. Nevertheless, fill in, but, <laughs> right? The people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. That means big, <laughs> right? And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Anakim, they're called. What are those? Those are the giants. That's right. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. He says, that. what are they saying? It's full of people. And there's giants there. And there are city-states. There are whole nations of people in this, the, beautiful though it be, this land that God has given us, they say with air quotes. You can almost hear it in the words that we're reading. Verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, hold on. He's like, wait, 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 wait. Because you can imagine. Remember, this is a people who likes to murmur. You know that? So as they're saying this, it starts off, everyone's like, ooh, ah. You can just hear it, right? The crowd's like, oh, those are the grapes, and they've got figs, and they've got pomegranates. All very luxurious fruit. And uh, then they say, and, and it's flowing with milk and honey. That's wonderful. That's great. We're so looking forward to it. And then they said, but, and everyone goes, oh. And they start describing how difficult. It's like, yeah, it's great land, but this is not going to be a cakewalk. Walled cities, nations of people, giants, 
and you can just hear it. Everybody, everybody starts murmuring. Everybody starts questioning. Everybody starts panicking. And so Caleb, in the midst of that, he's like, wait, wait. He sealed the people. You can see him, right? Wait, halt, calm down. Everybody, everyone stop the murmuring. We know what happened last time we started murmuring. A whole bunch of people died. Chill, he says. So Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. He's like, we don't even need to make a strategy. Let's just go. He says, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But, second but, the men that went up with him said, now we know, not all the men, but the majority of them, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Stronger than who? Stronger than we. Is that true? Probably. Now, I, don't, I doubt they're stronger in number. Okay, remember, this is, this is a 600 th plus thousand man army. Okay, there weren't a lot of 600,000 plus man armies in that day in the land of Canaan. But they had weapons and armor and chariots and walled cities so they may have been stronger than Israel. But Caleb wasn't thinking about how strong our army is compared to their army. Caleb is thinking about how strong our God is compared to their gods. That's what Caleb was thinking about. But the majority of the spies were not on the same page as Caleb. As they make very clear with their own words. For they are stronger than we. And they, that is the evil spies, brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. It sounds to me more like a land that we get to eat up. <laughs> Notice how they twisted it. There were figs and pomegranates and grapes so big it takes two men to carry them. And it's a land that floweth with milk and honey. But all of a sudden, now that they're interested in convincing everybody that they're right and that we can't do it and we need to go back and do something else with our lives, now it's a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. What happened to a land that floweth with milk and honey? It turned from a land that we get to eat up to a land that's going to eat us up. <laughs> Things change quickly, don't they? It says, it's a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. All of them. Now, the giants are the sons of Anak, the Anakim. Now, don't get me wrong. At this point, there's a lot of them. There are. There's, there's whole cities of them. Okay, But don't you think it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say, all of the people, all of the inhabitants of this land are of great stature. I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. They're not all sons of Anak. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. <laughs> and so we were in their sight. I told you just a few minutes ago. Here they are. They're on the cusp. They're on the precipice of entering into the promised land. Entering into the land of promise. Entering into the land of blessing. Entering into that victorious life that God had promised them. In other words, they were at a crossroads. They were at a crossroads. What's a crossroads? A crossroads is a place where you have multiple paths that intersect. Multiple paths. That means there's, there's a road. That road came from someplace. And that road is going someplace. And we have multiple roads intersecting at this one moment in this one place. Multiple roads. That means multiple uh, originations. People who came from multiple places. They're all intersecting at this one point, And they're all going to different destinations. Roads that came from dis different originations, all intersecting in this one point, taking them to different destinations. A crossroads. The title of the message this morning is Crossroads. 
Father, we pray that you'd bless. We pray that you would speak to our hearts as we study your word. Lord, give me power. Give me power to preach with clear words, with poignant words, with words that will be received and understood and applied simply and easily. Lord, I pray that each person is, that is here, each person that is listening, Lord, that they would be transformed because of the time they spend under your word today. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would be prepared, more prepared, better prepared for the crossroads in our lives. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. In 1 Kings 18.21... Elijah, it says, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? You know what, Israel, in Elijah's day, they found themselves at a crossroads. He said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. See, crossroads are, are an interesting place where we find ourselves in our lives. And crossroads can be very danger, a very dangerous place for us to find ourselves in our lives. What a crossroads, what that re represents for us in our message this morning is a place of decision. A crossroads for our message this morning is a place of of decision and it's funny because everybody reacts to these crossroads everybody reacts to these places of decision differently some people freeze that's what happened to the children of israel there in first kings the people answer he said how long halt you between two decisions if the lord be god follow him if baal then follow him make up your mind he says and the people answer him not a word i, like, I don't know what to do i don't know i don't know i don't know other people just rush in. <laughs> They're like, let's go. Where are we going? I don't know. Let's just do it. <laughs> and then other people think, they deliberate, and then they make a reasoned decision. Whatever the case may be, crossroads are an extremely important place and time in each of our lives. The crossroads that we find ourselves in may not be <clears throat> as dramatic as the crossroads both here and in 1 Kings that I've read to you this morning already as Israel found themselves in. But every single crossroads for Israel and every single crossroads that you will come upon, every single one of them is important and every single one of them has the potential to be a dangerous time in your life. And what I want to say to you this morning, and I think what we can learn from the observations that I want to make about the children of Israel in our passage this morning, is that you should be careful who you listen to when at a crossroads. Please, please, please be careful who you're listening to when you find yourself at a crossroads. You will find yourself at many crossroads throughout your life. Not just one, many. We could go throughout the Bible and point out crossroads after crossroads after crossroads in the life of the children of Israel. And every single one of them was important. Because every single choice you make sets you on a path, and every single path you walk is leading you to a destination. That's just the reality of it. And the question is, what destination are you headed to? Is it a destination of blessing? Is it a destination of victory? Or is it a destination of conflict and regret and pain and destruction? All of those are possible choices. That's the danger of crossroads, is that you have an almost infinite choice of, of, of paths that you may choose from at every single one of them. And so that's why the lesson this morning, the truth this morning is so vitally important. Please be careful who you listen to when at a crossroads. Now in our passage, I think the narrative breaks up very easily into three major portions. First of all, you see that the Lord uh, commands Moses that he would choose 
spies to send into the land. God says, you need to choose some, you need to, um, choose some spies. You need to choose some men who are going. What does he say to him? He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find some men who can put some feet on the ground and put some eyes on the ground and then they can bring back and give you some uh, actionable live input about what you're walking into. Sounds pretty wise to me. We're about ready to step off of, onto a path. We're about ready to walk into a new stage of life. And we need to know what we're walking into. God says, hey, do this thing. So Moses does it. Then we see the choosing of the people. God instructs them um, to seek input. And then he instructs them. He gives them the instructions on what they're, well, the kind of input they're supposed to, uh, uh, to gather. Uh, in verses 17 to 25, Moses gives instruction to the spies. He says, listen, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go into the land. They actually had to go south up into a mountain to go through a pass in order to get into the land. But then they go up north into the land. And as they go, he says, I want you to check out the land. See what kind of land it is. Check out the people. See what kind of people they are. Do they dwell in tents? Do they dwell in cities? Are they many? Are they few? Is the land good land? Is the land arable land? Are there trees? Is there wood? Tell us what we're walking into. Tell us what to expect. Give us some information. Give us some input so that we can make good plans and strategies to, in order that we may move forward in an informed way. That's what Moses said to the spies. And then the last portion of the narrative of our passage is the spies return and their report. And as the song tells us so, so uh, profoundly, ten were bad and two were good. Now, we didn't read about the two good in this portion of the passage. You've got to go forward into chapter 14 to hear about the second good report from Joshua. Yeshua, right? But uh, there were two, two, ten were bad and two were good. So we have three, three narrative sections. First of all, God, through, by God's instruction, Moses chooses some men... Uh, in order that they might get input from those men as they move forward. Secondly, he gives instructions to those men, says, listen, here's the kind of input we want to hear. We want to know numbers. We want to know uh, where they're at. We want to know what kind of land there is. Why is that? Because, you know, they probably want to know where the good land is so they can go conquer that first. Right? Because they've got to settle their families and they've got to settle their people as they go in. And so they've got to set up a strategy. And then we, of course, see the report, which, for the most part, was an evil report. And again, I say to you, be careful who you listen to when at a crossroads. So we have these three narrative sections, and there's three points of application that I want to make with you as we look more closely at these narrative sections this morning. Three points of application in support of this idea that you ought to be careful who you listen to when at a crossroads. First of all, you should, by the way, when you come to a crossroads, number one, obediently seek out input when you're at a crossroads. Okay? Again, in our passage, at the beginning of our passage, listen to what it says. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. God told him to pick out some spies. God told him to uh, seek some input. This was done at the instruction of God. This was not some whim of Moses's. This was not some human notion. This is a biblical notion. This is an idea. This is a truth that is pervasive in the word of God. When you come to a crossroads, when you're at a place of decision, when you come to a fork in the road, when you've got to make a choice which way you're going to go in your life, it is wise to seek input from others. God tells the children of Israel to get some input before they go into the land. And the Bible is rife with commands that we need to seek out input when we come to a crossroads. And so number one, obediently seek out input when at a crossroads. Let me give you some examples of where this is found in other places in Scripture. Proverbs eleven fourteen tells us, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. 
What does God say? Not only seek out input, get a lot of input. Don't just listen to one person, listen to a lot of people. By the way, this is true, I think, when it comes to news. <laughs> Don't just listen to one news source, listen to a lot of news. Everybody shake your head. It's a good idea. Even if you disagree with what they're saying, it doesn't hurt to know what they're saying. And if you only listen to one, one voice all the time, you're just going to become very monotone in what you have to say. You're going to lack nuance. You're going to lack understanding of what's going on around you. And so it makes sense whether we're talking about where we get our news from or whether we're talking about, listen, even preaching. It's a good idea to listen to more than one preacher. Now, I'm not saying you should jump from church to church. <laughs> Number one, that'd be bad for our church. Number two, that'd be bad for any church. Number three, that'd be bad for you. But it doesn't hurt you to listen to more than one preacher. You can have your church and your pastor, but then you can have other preachers that you respect and you love and who have been a blessing to you that you can listen to. But the, 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 the day and age we live in, there's so much access to preaching. There's so much access to God's word. You can find preachers on the radio. You can find preachers online. Man, today it's even, it's even more wide. Man, guys that I only got to listen to once or twice a year, I can listen to them every week now. Because everybody's doing live streams. <laughs> you know, I, all I've got to do is go after church uh, this afternoon. I can go online, go on my phone, and in seconds I can pull up some of my friends that are preachers and I can listen to what they had to say today. And I can get encouraged. And listen, that's important to preachers. It's important to preachers to get preaching. Sometimes we don't get a lot of preaching. And sometimes that's because we're too jealous of our pulpit and we need to give up our pulpit sometimes and let other people preach so that we can get preached to as well. But also, it's just because we have a responsibility and we're doing the preaching a lot of the time. And so we don't get to hear preaching. Listen, you guys maybe take it for granted getting to hear preaching every week. I don't get to hear preaching every week unless I'm seeking out preaching from multiple sources. And that's important. I would say it's probably important for you, too. I hope, I hope I'm a decent preacher for you. But just like news sources, if the only preaching you're ever hearing is from me, you might become a little monotone spiritually. So seek out other, other sources of preaching of the word of God. I think it would be good. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 15, 22. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. They plan to take the land. God said, hey, go get some input. Send one man from every tribe. Get, send 12 counselors so they can bring back input. It says, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. In Proverbs 24, 6. For by wise counsel, thou shalt make thy war. And in multitude of counselors, there is safety. Listen, one of the kinds of crossroads that you'll find yourself in is a crossroads of conflict. Anytime you enter into conflict or you come face to face with conflict in your family or in your workplace or in your church or in your life in general, that's a crossroads. How you enter into that conflict, how you handle that conflict, and how, do you, how you walk out of that conflict. Listen, that is a crossroads. He says, in the, and, and, and from counsel by counsel, thou shalt make war. You need, when you have time of conflict, you need counsel. You need counselors. You need input from multiple sources. You need that. So we see, first of all, when it comes to uh, input, that you should obediently seek out input when at a crossroads. The second thing that I think we can observe from this narrative event in the life of Israel is that you should clearly articulate the kind of input you want when at a crossroads. Number one... When you're at a crossroads, you should be obedient to God and seek input. Seek counsel. Get, listen to some other voices besides your own. Okay? That's number one. But number two, when seeking that input, make sure to articulate clearly what kind of input you want. And be careful from whom you seek that input. So back in our text... Let me clarify this. It was not God's instruction that they should seek the kind of input that was looking for problems and looking for reasons why they can't move forward and why they should turn back. That was not God's intent. Look at chapter 13, verse 2. Back in our text, Numbers chapter 13, verse 2. God said to Moses, send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan. Listen to this. This is the key part. Which I give unto the children of Israel. 
the verb tense there means that God was giving it and was going to keep on giving it. It's, it's done. I've given it. I am giving it. I'm going to keep on giving it. That's the verb tense there. It's done. It, the, deal, the deal's already done. So what God was not saying, you know what? You better send some people in there because maybe, maybe you guys can't do this thing. Maybe it's not possible. I mean, I said that I was going to give you land, but maybe you can't do it. Maybe we need to go to some other land. So, so get some input, get some counselors, and maybe someone can talk you out of it. That's not what God was saying. And that's not the kind of input that, that Moses was seeking, and he made it clear. See, God had already given them the land. The deal was already done. The spy mission was not to see if they could do it, but rather to gather information in order to encourage them and to build anticipation and excitement for them. That was the purpose of the input. Look at verses 17, 20. Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto, the, said unto them, Get ye up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land. What, is, what it is and the people that dwell therein and whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good and, or bad. And what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether it be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage. In the end, did those, man, did those men sound very courageous? They did not. As a matter of fact, I would imagine that those men probably would not have lasted 40 days and would not have brought back any of the good report that they did bring back if not for two men named Caleb and Joshua. I guarantee you, though you'll not find this in the narrative, that they were the ringleaders. They were the ones that kept them going forward. They were the ones who were trying to fulfill the mission that Moses had articulated. He said, this is the input we want. Why? So that we can make a plan, so that we can devise a strategy, so that we can be encouraged, so that we can anticipate and be excited about what God has already promised and what God has already given us. Moses was asking the spies to put some eyes on the ground so that they could give input to enable and facilitate the mission which God's word had already promised, promised that they would accomplish. And maybe God has given you some, uh, an opportunity. Maybe God has given you a calling. Listen, there are some young men and young women here who've been called to full-time ministry and you've articulated, listen, this is what God wants me to do. And listen, you need to get some input. You need to get some help along the way, but not the kind of input that will try to talk you out of what you already know God has told you to do. I'm not saying look for yes men. I'm saying look for men who care just as much about what God has said as you do. Be careful about seeking input from people who could care less about the word of God. Be careful about seeking input from people who could care less about the will of God. Be careful about that. Because there are plenty of people who are willing to give you that kind of input. Oh, number one, obediently seek out input when at a crossroads. Number two, clearly articulate the kind of input you want when at a crossroads. And number three, biblically filter the input you get when at a crossroads. Yes, seek out input when you're at a place of decision. Yes, uh, tell people, listen, I need some input. I need some help. Would you give me some input? But in the end, what you need to do is you need to filter all that input through God's word before you act. Number three, biblically filter the input you get when at a crossroads. And that brings us to the final narrative portion in our passage, verses 26 to 33. And we know because of hindsight, this last point that I make, that you ought to biblically filter the input you get, is not what the children of Israel did. Unfortunately. It's not what they did. As a matter of fact, we've talked about the fact that um, at the, they've come to this point, they've come to this crossroads, but now they're going to they're end up as a result of this day. This was a big day in Israel's life. This was a big day in all the adults' lives that are there at this time. Because now they're going to spend the next 40 years just walking in circles in their spiritual life, accomplishing nothing until they're all dead, so that God can move forward with the next generation. He couldn't move forward with that generation he couldn't do anything wonderful with that generation, so he was just going to allow them to stagnate until that generation dies off. 
so that maybe he could do something great with their children. Is that the kind of legacy that we want to leave behind for our children? We didn't do anything great because we listened to the wrong input. We listened to the wrong counselors. We didn't do anything great. Maybe God will do something with you once we're gone. I don't know about you parents. That's not the legacy I want to leave for my kids. I want to take this football as far down the field as I can so that they've got a greater shot at success. I want them to do bigger and greater things than me, yes, but not in spite of me. I want to give them a, sh- I want to give them a hand up. I want to give them help, not a hindrance. So we know, because of hindsight, that this is exactly what the children of Israel did not do. They did not biblically filter the input that they received at this crossroads. So there were two distinct messages, two distinct sorts of input brought by the spies. One sort of input was intended to provide encouragement, anticipation, and excitement. And that was the input brought by Caleb and Joshua. Again, in Numbers 13, 30, Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. I told you in Numbers 14, we hear the report of Joshua in verse 6, and, <clears throat> and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. That's a public dis- display of despair. Because of what they were seeing happen among their brothers and sisters. It says they rent their clothes and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel saying the land which we passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. Remember what, we were, what I noted when we were just reading the passage? How that at the beginning they were like, oh, it's a man, look at figs and pomegranates and grapes that are so huge it takes multiple men to carry one cluster. And it's a land that floweth with milk and honey. What does that mean? that means our cattle are going to do good here. Right? Our cattle are going to do great. Milk comes from cattle. They were, a peop- they, were, they, were, they were a people that had herds. They were looking for a place to settle their herds. Remember when they were looking for meat, and God said, I'm going to give you meat. And he said, what do you want me to do, kill all the animals? They had been purposely not eating their cattle. Why? Because they're waiting to get to the land of promise. So they can settle their cattle and so they can graze their cattle and so they can breed their cattle and so that they can live for future generations. They had plans. They had expectations. And and they said it was a land that floweth with milk and honey. And then all of a sudden they said it's a hard land. It's a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. But Joshua and Caleb said, listen, this land which we passed through to search it, it's an exceeding good land. He said, listen to this, verse 8. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us. A land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. What has God said? God said, I've given you the land. God said, this is the land that I promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. This is the land that I did all the wonders of Egypt in order to bring you to. This is the reason behind all of it. Why? Because I want to I want to succor you. I want to nurture you. I want to make you a people peculiar to myself so that I can bring the Messiah into the world through you and save all the people of all the nations. That was God's plan. And this land was a part of that plan. And and Joshua and Caleb were like, listen, this is a good land and God can give it to us. Just obey him. Just believe him. Just follow him. He says, only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. They're not going to eat us up, we're going to eat them up. (laughs) That's what he said, they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. They're afraid, he says. Their knees are knocking. They're so afraid of us. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Not, they said. So, this was one sort of input. And then the other sort. The first, the first sort of input was, incur- was intended to provide encouragement and anticipation and excitement. The other sort of input that they received was given in order to produce in- discouragement, trepidation, and fear. 
And when you come to a crossroads in your life, there will be people who will try to encourage you, who will try to give you anticipation and excitement about the future and what God's going to do with you. And then there will be people who will try to discourage you and try to cause you to feel trepidation and fear and fretting and nervousness and try to keep you from doing anything good for the Lord. Numbers 13, 31 to 33. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it were men of great stature. And, they were, and, and there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Isn't it interesting? It's amazing, really. How... Two different groups of people can look at the same set of facts, the same reality, and come to completely different conclusions. How is that possible? There's one land. There, there are people in that land. There are animals in that land. There are plants in that land. They went and saw the land. J Caleb and Joshua said, we can do it. Our God is able. These people, they're nothing. They're like bread. Let's, have them, let's put some butter on it and have them for breakfast. That's what, Jacob and, that's what Joshua and Caleb said. The other men said, oh, we're like grasshoppers. They're going to squish us. This land's going to eat us up. Forget it. It's not worth it. It's a hard land. It eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Which way is it? You can't have it both ways. These are two mutually exclusive fact claims. They can't both be true. Right? And you know the same thing's true today. <laughs> oh, man. I've, I've watched the news over the past few weeks and just been amazed how multiple people can look at an event and come to completely different conclusions. I watched a reporter at one of the riots where people were destroying police cars and destroying businesses and attacking other people. And this news guy was standing there and he said this, as a building was exploding and, and burning in flames in the background of the camera shot, he says, it's mostly peaceful. <laughs> and this is why my warning for you today is so serious. Be careful who you listen to. When you come to a crossroads. America needs to be careful. We're at a crossroads as a nation, aren't we? A crossroads of conflict. A crossroads where we could end up at very different destinations. And you know what's going to largely determine which path we take as a nation? Who we listen to. Who we listen to. And you know what's not going to make a difference, a real difference for good in the lives of America? Is political pundits. They're not going to make a big difference. You know what is not going to make a difference? Who is not going to make a huge difference in the life of America going forward? Democrats or Republicans. They're not going to make a big difference. I'm not terribly old. But, you know, I've been watching this process for a lot of years. I've seen more Republican presidents than I have Democrat presidents in my life. I've seen more Republican presidents than Democrat presidents. And you know what I've seen the difference to be between when Republicans are in control and Democrats are in control? Very little. They're not going to turn this country around. They're not going to make a big difference. The only truth that we can listen to that's going to make a big difference is the truth of the Word of God. It's if preachers will stand behind pulpits and preach the gospel and preach the death, burial, and resurrection. Because insofar, listen to me, Fulton Bible Baptist Church, insofar as capitalism or communism is a problem in our nation, the thing that's going to turn our country around and make a difference is the truth of the Word of God. Insofar as racism is an institutional systemic problem in America, the thing that's going to make a difference is not some political movement. It's the truth of the word of God. Amen. 
And insofar as a virus is an earth-shattering problem for our, co our country or our world, insofar as it is a problem, it's not going to be a vaccine that really changes people's lives. It's the truth of the Word of God. It's the truth of the Word of God that really changes people from the inside out. It's through the truth of the Word of God that the early disciples, the Bible tells us, turned the world upside down. And if we want to see our families change, and if we want to see our church change and move forward in this crossroads, if we want to see our state change, or our nation change, or our world change, then we have to be very, very careful who we listen to. And let me say this. When it comes to the people who are trying to give you input, and when you come to these crossroads, this is just an anecdotal observation, okay, from our narrative. This isn't like a stated biblical truth, but I I, you can observe it in many places in the Bible, and I've observed it in life. There will, be, there will always be people giving you, more people giving you the wrong input than giving you the right input. Remember the song? Ten were bad, and two were good. Only two. And guess who won? The majority. They won. The children of Israel went with them. Remember in chapter 14, we'll get there next week. Caleb and Joshua rent their clothes. They saw what was happening. Guess what? <clears throat> there were only two men who were adult men of that generation that got to go into the promised land in the end. Guess who they were? Caleb, Caleb and Joshua. And that mad dog that said, we can do it, let's go now. Guess, guess what he did? He's the one who killed most of the giants. <laughs> Hebron, the city where the giants were at, he says, I want that mountain. Everybody else is afraid, I'll go. He was an old man when they went back. But he did it. There's always going to be more people who will discourage you. More people who will bring you to fear. More people who will tell you the wrong thing. There will be more people who will give you input that is contrary to God's word than those whose input is in agreement with God's word. If you're looking for the wrong kind of input, you know what you'll find? You'll find an echo chamber. If that's what you're looking for, you'll, you'll find never-ending encouragement toward that. I have people who I know, who I care about, who uh, have made choices that I believe are destructive in their lives. And I see them on social media constantly asking for input. And particularly looking for the, uh, input, the kind of input that affirms them in their destructive choices. And you know what they get plenty of? You go, girl. You're right. You're a better you than you've ever been before. You made the right choice. And if anyone dares to stand up and say, you know, I think you're making a bad choice. You don't love me. If you loved me, you would support me. You're the bad guy. You're the bad guy. And that's where we're getting to in America, too. You stand up and you say, I think destroying other people's property is wrong. Then you're racist. And you're a hater. And that's a really bad place for our country to be. We're listening to the wrong input. But if you're looking for the wrong kind of input, you'll find plenty of it. As the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, he says, Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there. You'll find an echo chamber if you're looking for that. Be careful who you listen to. I mean, that 